Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c Do you want to up your game when it comes to doing interviews, whether job interviews or just extracting the most important information you need on the job? Then this is the episode for you, because my next guest is an Emmy Award winning journalist with more than 30 years of experience reporting from around the world. He's also an author and a professor who teaches students the art of the interview. But before I introduce you to Frank Sesno, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive look inside the episodes and the professions we're going to be featuring that week. And it is super easy to do. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And the sign up box is right there on the homepage. Now, my friends, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Frank Sesno, the director of the George Washington University's School of Media and Public Affairs, where he leads over two dozen world-class faculty members and teaches classes on the art of the interview, journalism ethics, and sustainability reporting. Frank has interviewed heads of state as well as other luminaries, including Bill Gates, Anderson Cooper, Nobel Prize winning scientists, renowned economists, Hollywood celebrities, CEOs, best selling authors, and leaders from a wide range of industries. Frank is also a sought after public speaker and moderator who has masterfully elevated scores of events around the world. Frank is the author of the book, Ask More, The Power of Questions to Open Doors, Uncover Solutions, and Spark Change. Frank, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you still caffeinated on your hot tea and ready to go? I am caffeinated and ready to go, yes. (laughs) Thank you very much for having me. Well, it is such a pleasure to get this opportunity. And before we get into what you are doing now at George Washington University and how you progressed in your career building one heck of a professional skyscraper, I want our young listeners to know that you and I have had some parallels in our professional journeys. The first of which is that we have the same alma mater. We both went to Middlebury College. We both became journalists after we graduated, and we both worked together at CNN for years. In fact, at one time, you are my boss. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it was my pleasure. And we are going to touch on that a little bit later in this interview. But first, I would love for us, for all of us, to learn more about the kind of courses that the School of Media and Public Affairs offers and what you do there, Frank, as the director of that school. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say that it really has been wonderful having these overlapping episodes with you and having these opportunities to work together and collaborate together. So I am totally thrilled to be on on your show, Andrea, and I'm just delighted that you're doing this and and making such a difference in, in the lives of so many people. What do we do at the School of Media Public Affairs? We have two majors. One is journalism, mass communication. That sort of speaks for itself. How do we tell stories? How are media changing? What are new techniques, creative ways of connecting with an audience? The other part of us, though, is political communication. And that's actually a subfield of political science. We are a really interdisciplinary unit. We're not a pre-professional school. We're not a journalism school in the traditional sense. We're very much a liberal arts kind of experience. So a student with us who's majoring in journalism is studying journalism, but they're studying it in the context of the liberal arts, critical thinking, synthesis analysis, that kind of thing. A student who's studying political communication is studying sort of the theory and the and our understanding of how media and political communicators connect to inform, organize, mobilize, advocate that looks at theory of framing and media agenda setting and that kind of thing. So I like to refer to it as the two sides of the seesaw. 
one side that tries to make the news or fashion the news and the other side that tries to report the news. What are the kinds of courses that we offer? Everything from sort of core understanding, theoretical understanding of political communication, as I say, framing, agenda setting, media bias, those kinds of things, right up through courses that look at ethical behaviors and uh, how these areas of media connect with conflict, war, uh, global affairs, sustainability. We have documentary offerings. So it's a really rich media diet, I think, at a time when media are very much in the spotlight and very much going to be increasingly in the spotlight because of some of the less savory things that are happening out there, like these disinformation campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. So what does the director of the school do? Directs. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, you know, it's so interesting in a university setting, there's faculty governance. We work together to make the big decisions. So what I do is I try to raise the money to provide as much opportunity for the faculty who are doing research or creative work as much money as I can to enable different experiences for our students. We have a number of other activities that we do. We have an Institute for Data, Democracy, and Politics that's looking into disinformation campaigns, doing hard research on that, trying to untangle that mess. We have an Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. So how can people-to-people -people exchanges and media work together to increase understanding? There's a concept, right? I started this project called Planet Forward. This is a student driven sustainability storytelling platform. So as director, I try to manage these different things. We have a lot of events, people in, people through. So my job is the overview job of the place and trying to connect us to as many relevant outside partners as possible, whether they're media companies, public affairs companies, polling organizations, that kind of thing. Got it. You were joking at the beginning when you said that the director of the school directs, and it really does kind of conjure the image of a conductor. And I think the picture that you painted there, even though you mentioned managing, is one of a conductor. Yeah. And I think, too, and this is challenging in higher education because you're dealing with so many things at once, is what is happening? Where are we going? What's changing? Higher education itself college, universities, they, they really need to change because students are learning differently. They have access to different kinds of technologies themselves. So one of the big parts of my job, of any director's job or anybody who's in a leadership role in higher education, anywhere, really, you have to look over the horizon. You have to imagine what's happening not just a year or two years from now, but three years, five years, 10 years from now, and see how you adjust for that. So how do we hire differently? How do we structure ourselves differently? What do we need to be preparing for? What are the different technologies people are going to be working on, especially in a school like ours, where people are working with video production, digital production, uh, infographics, and that kind of thing. So that's part of the job and part of the really challenging dimension of everything, because the, <laughs> the world, especially this world, is changing so quickly. No doubt. So could you take us into a typical day for you on the job, Frank, if we were a fly on the wall in your office, in your building, office building, what would we be seeing and hearing you do? You'd be seeing and hearing me meeting with a lot of people over the course of the day because I, there are, I have a lot of stakeholders. So there are students, there are faculty, staff, there are fundraisers and people who fund various projects of ours. There are deans and other directors, and I work with them. So I might be working cooperatively with the School of Nursing, literally, on how the School of Nursing is trying to think about how they can use media in their curricula to teach their students. Or I had a meeting not too long ago with the dean of the School of Engineering, and we were talking about the Planet Forward project that we've got, which is looking ahead. And when we think about um, how we teach our students to communicate what they're doing. Do engineers, and I've had the same similar meetings with, with people in the sciences, do they need to be better communicators? And if they need to be better communicators, and the answer is almost always yes, what tools do they need? Well, how can we work together to accomplish that? We have fellows. We have outside visitors this year. Two of our fellows are Steve Scully from C-SPAN and Karen Finney, who was a senior strategist with the Hillary Clinton campaign, and first African-American woman spokesperson for the DNC. So I work with our, with our fellows to think about how they're going to be interacting with our students, with our faculty doing public events. We do public events. 
So we plan our public events, who will be our speakers, who will be coming to campus to engage our students and our wider community. We want to raise our profile. We want people to know who we are and what we're doing, how much research we're doing. A faculty member publishes a book. He's just dug into new research on digital advocacy. In other words, advocacy that happens not in person, but over the digital virtual space. That's really interesting. How do we get what he has learned from his research out to a wider community? So these are the meetings and the planning and the different things that I'm doing. Then there's some of the mundane stuff. I get to do budget meetings. That's always fun. Right. But, and then, and this is what makes this job different and really great. Pretty much every day I will have a meeting with a student, whether it's a student from a class I'm teaching or a student who's just come by for career advice. And we just will sit and talk and I will do what I can to listen and to help. Fantastic. Well, we are trying to scale those one-on-one career advice sessions that you have with the very fortunate students at GW so that students all around the U.S. and the world can have access to your wonderful wisdom and expertise. And I thought it would be interesting for our listeners, Frank, to learn a bit more about your creative thought process as it applies to one of the projects that you mentioned that you actually started with Planet Forward, which was launched in 2009. And in particular, how you went about conceiving of and then structuring what became a multimedia initiative, highlighting storytelling about innovation and sustainability, and in this case, in energy, food, water, the built environment, and on and on. And in this initiative, you have partnered with a whole range of media partners, whether it's Bloomberg TV, National Geographic, PBS, HuffPost, And you've created a summit, the Planet Forward Summit. So without going into detail about the actual initiative itself, could you share with our young listeners how you did the strategy, how you laid out the vision of what Planet Forward would become? Sure. When I came to George Washington University, I came from... George Mason. I actually went to George Mason first, where I had a media project there. And I had gone into the academic world from CNN, from being a journalist, storyteller, being in the media. And when I went to a university, I thought, and I felt very, very strongly, that the university is a fabulous platform for a media enterprise. Why? Because universities are filled with students who are learning faculty who are researching. They have credibility and stature in the community. They have an attention span. They've been around for hundreds of years. They ain't going anywhere. And they really, to me, are all about the future. The people who are there will run the future. They will inherit the future. They will influence the future in every way, you know, literally and figuratively. And so what could I do to leverage up and out what is happening on these campuses? In the case of the Planet Forward thing, when I came to GW, I thought, what should my focus be? What should this project be? And I literally went into a year-long thought process on that. And I met with a number of people, people in media, people in university settings, who thought about this sort of thing for a while. And I thought initially about maybe doing I don't want to call it a variety show, but, you know, at a university, what do you have? You have the history department, the science department, you have the business school, you have the law school. What if we did a series of events or conversations engaging all these different disciplines? You know, think about I did the Sunday show at CNN for years and do something different every week because you'd follow the news. It was there a corollary to that. I met with somebody who had helped to redesign the New Yorker. And what he told me was, don't do a variety show. Establish a, an area where you can develop your expertise, where you can be known for something. And that really stuck with me because that was a big change. That was a different way of thinking about it than I had gone into it. And then I started thinking, okay, well, what would that be if we were to take an issue and really own it? And that's when I, after talking again to a lot of people, I came on this issue of sustainability of the planet. Because why? It's global and it's local. It's about business. It's about technology. It's about history. It's about commerce. It's about culture. It is legislative and it is behavioral and it is going to resound forever 
because we'll never solve this problem, right? There will always be things we need to deal with. So that's what I did. I decided on this. I gathered a group of students. I remember I called them my genius brigade. Uh, I didn't have a name for the project. And we just went into a room with a whiteboard. We started playing around once I had the concept and came up with this idea, Planet Forward. We named it Planet Forward because it's forward leaning. That kind of conveys energy and I hope optimism. How do we move the planet forward? That suggests that we actually can make progress here. And so that's what we've done. We now have two dozen schools, more than two dozen schools that are formally affiliated with us as a consortium school, highly diverse schools. We have students who are planet forward correspondents all over the country. And we have more than 5,000 stories that have been posted. Wow, that is just remarkable. So as I noted in the introduction to our interview today, Frank is a superb interviewer. In fact, he actually gets paid to moderate events all over the world. Frank, what makes a good interview? If we were in my kitchen right now and we were trying to kind of cook up a magnificent souffle of an interview. What would the ingredients be that we would need to include in that dish? First, interest. You have to be very interested in the person you're interviewing, no matter where they're from or what they're doing. Second, interest translates into curiosity. Tell me more. I want to go deeper. I want to understand everything. Third, the questions themselves. Clear, concise, one at a time, They can be complex, they can be tough, they can be funny, they can be warm. Next, listening. It doesn't make much sense to ask a great question if you don't have the capacity to listen really closely, to hear what's been said, what's been revealed, what's been withheld, and then have a clear follow-up. You have to have a sense of trajectory for an interview. I tell people interviews are like plane rides. You taxi, you take off, you fly, you descend and you land. And if you don't do it in that order, it feels like a pretty lousy plane ride and you can even crash because all of a sudden, boom, it's over and that's pretty abrupt. What are you trying to accomplish? I think going into a great interview, you want to have a really good sense of what you want out of it. Are you looking for information, revelation, affirmation? Are you hoping that someone is going to reveal themselves in some remarkable way? Are you seeking a particular piece of information or a better understanding about something? Good example, you're interviewing a scientist, just got the Nobel Prize. What do you want out of that interview? Do you really want to understand the science of what got the prize? Or do you want to understand the impact of that prize on that scientist's life? Do you know what that scientist went through to get that prize? Is that what you're trying to get out? Because they've been working on this all their lives. This is the product of 50 years of research. So having a real sense of what you want out of an interview and putting these pieces together, I think, makes it a better experience. But the first ingredient, Andrea, the most important ingredient is just plain honest to God, sincere curiosity. I care about you. I'm fascinated by you as a person and what you've done. You can also be repulsed by them, right? If you're interviewing, say you're interviewing a a murderer, right? You're on death row, right? So it doesn't mean that you approve, but you're still fascinated. You're still curious about that person. I've heard too many interviews where I don't, you almost wonder whether someone's just reading a list of questions. That's not a good interview. Over-preparing doesn't make for a great interview. Being overly curious does. Hmm. Fantastic advice. Now, not all of our young listeners today necessarily want to become journalists, but most of them, if not all of them, have gone through job interviews or will be going through job interviews. What advice do you have for them, Frank, as to how they can make a good impression during a job interview and not only give good answers to the questions they're being asked, but also ask good questions of the person interviewing them. Well, the book that I wrote, Ask More, I wrote not for journalists, but from a journalist's experience. So what I was just talking about, what goes into a good interview, really, I believe, goes into a good life. Your life partner and you will have a better experience if you're both really curious about one another. Even after you know, my wife and I have been married for 39 years, I still don't know everything about her. She doesn't know everything about me. We still ask one another questions. My kids, I'm interested in their lives. Sometimes they say, quit interviewing me, Dad. But <laughs> <laughs> I am interested. So you got you to moderate it. A bit. One of the chapters in the book is about the job interview. Some people say that that's the most important place where they get asked questions, and certainly the most transactional because 
It either turns into a job or it does not. And what I found in researching this and talking to people who do hiring and talking to headhunters, all of that, sure, you want to prepare for your job interview. You want to know who you're talking to. What is their personal background, if, if you can figure that out so you know where they're coming from. You can anticipate how you would respond. You want to go in with a good sense of what your responses will be to their questions about your future and what you want to do, your strengths, your weaknesses, all of that. But things that people don't often think about that also drive interviews, job interviews to a very large degree, and they certainly have with me when I have hired, is when I turn the tables, I'm interviewing a candidate, and I say, what questions do you have for me? This is when I know whether the job applicant has done his or her homework, because their questions will reveal their depth of knowledge about my business where I'm doing well, where my challenges are, where the opportunities are, where the threats are from the competitors. Their questions will reveal whether they've done any homework about me. Oh, you've been at GW for 11 years or for 13 years. What, did, what have you seen change the most? Where do you think the place is going? Oh, I see that the new president is putting an emphasis on science and engineering. Is that going to, how is that going to affect the future of the university's mission? That shows me and impresses me that someone has really dug in, done their homework. And then some other things. Well, I'm a creative person. What will my creative opportunities be here? How could I be most creative and contribute to the team? So the kinds of questions you as a job candidate bring to an interview, say just legions about who you are, how engaged you are in this job search, in this particular job opening and in how you perceive yourself. You know, I've always taken initiative in my job and I did this or I did that. I hope to do this here. Where would that be most helpful? The kinds of questions you ask and how you ask them convey and, and project tremendously about who you are, as I say, as, as both a person and a job prospect. So that's, that's what I would say. Work on understanding the place and how you would answer the question that you will inevitably be asked. But know what questions that you will pose because they are just as illuminating as the answers you provide. Absolutely. The only thing that I might add or maybe ask you, Frank, is certainly at the beginning of your answer there was a very sophisticated level of questioning. I would say for somebody who's going in for an entry-level job interview, I think perhaps to ask about the direction of the university or that, would you be looking for that level of sophistication with somebody who's applying for an assistant position or an associate position? That's a very good point, Andrea. Probably not. Probably not. And in fact, you've got to be careful in an entry-level position about asking big questions like that because they can come off as arrogant. I'm 22. I'm graduating now. Tell me where your organization is going in the next five years. So a lot of this really reflects where you are, who you're talking to, what the level of familiarity is, what your level of expertise is. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't still and shouldn't still show curiosity about the place you're going to. You can say, if you're starting out, you certainly can be talking about what you can provide and the energy that you will bring, recognizing, too, that you are more potential than you are experienced at an entry-level job. If someone's coming to me right out of school and, and I'm hiring them, I am not hiring them because they have 25 years of experience in marketing. I'm hiring them because they have an impressive track record in their internships and their studies, because they show great talent and intelligence, and because I'm looking to fill a particular position. So from a candidate like that, if that's you, things to be asking are more along the lines of, how can I help? What are you looking for? What are the five things you hope that I learn over the first year so that I can be even more valuable? You want to emphasize your value to the company. You can ask, though, where are you trying to take the company? Because you want to be positioning yourself as the person who can help do that. So that's important. That's good information to ask. How you ask that, though, that's a really good point. I'm glad you, glad you steered that because... You send a lot of signals when you're in an interview and really sizing up who you are, where you're coming from, what your experience is, who you're sitting across from, what is the job that you're applying for. Those are all factors that need to be brought into that calculation before you sit down. Yes. And I would just say to echo one of Frank's points there, which is super important, and that is preparation. No matter what job you're going in for, you need to do your homework. That's right. So no doubt, Frank, some of our young listeners are 
aspiring journalists, or maybe they could already be in the field. And as you and I know, when you're a journalist, there are lots of people that you need to interview, whether they're in government or the private sector, who don't necessarily want to give you a straight answer. And one of the things that I struggled with, honestly, when I began covering the State Department for CNN was something called nuance and how to parse the answers that government officials in this case would give me. And in fact, I joked that when I started covering the State Department, I actually had to learn another language, a language called diplomatese. Could you please explain to our young listeners what nuance is? It doesn't only exist in what government officials say, but how they should think about asking the right questions to try to draw out the truth or the facts for their stories from people who don't want to give it. Ooh, there's a lot there because there's a challenge to drawing out the facts and the truth even when people do want to give it because people will offer limited or selective explanation and that's why you listen so carefully. I think the most important thing in all cases, Andrea, would be first the preparation, knowing as much as you can know. Think of it a little bit like a lawyer, right? Lawyers depose their witnesses before they go to trial. They actually know what people are going to say before they put them on the stand. They look at the documentary evidence around it, the case. They spend a ton of time preparing. That is something that needs to go into any interview. And then very close listening to, to hear what someone has said or hasn't said, what, where they've explained something or where they haven't planning a series of follow-up questions on any given thing. So let's say I, I was interviewing you about your experience as a diplomatic correspondent. Where did you work? What were you up against? When did you get information that was sensitive information? And how did you decide whether to report it or whether to withhold it? Well, you would tell me, you'd give me an example. I'd say, well, is that because there were lives at stake? And you'd say, yes. Well, how did you know there were lives at stake? Well, somebody told me, well, how did you know that they were being sincere? How did you know that they weren't just trying to spin you? If you disagreed with them and you put it on the air anyway, what were the judgments that went into that? Well, the public has a right to know. Well, how do you measure the public's right to know? So it's that <laughs> six-year-olds do this really well. They ask, 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 ask until the point you want to say, can you stop asking me questions and let me make dinner? And that's kind of what you have to do. It's about embracing complexity. And understanding that there is complexity to virtually any issue. And your job as the questioner is to take that complexity apart into its individual threads and then look at each thread or some of those threads, the ones that are, are relevant, to see what they're made of. That's really what you're doing as a questioner. You're dissecting an issue through someone who knows it or who has experienced it. Some may be willing participants in this process and they may want to speak and you're then the tour guide. You're putting together the logical path to understanding. Others are reluctant or they may be hostile and then you may be using a combination of types of questions prodding, confrontational, enticing, drawing someone out, getting there over time to obtain that level of understanding. So it's a fascinating pursuit, but I'd say at the root of it is the preparation you talked about, knowing as much as you can know, being very clear about what you're trying to get out of the exchange, how much you're taking it apart, and then trying to identify those threads and examine each in its own right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Let's <laughs> flash back very quickly to when you were in college. You went to Middlebury. As we said, we both went to Middlebury. You were an American history major and a French minor. Did yeah. you know what you were going to do with your major when you graduated? Absolutely not. Not only did I not know what I was going to do with my major, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I, I, I went to college thinking, oh, well, I'll I'll, maybe I'll go to law school. So first year, I went to the pre-law club or whatever the heck it was. And I listened to the professor and I looked around the room and I said, nope, not for me. Can't do this. Not going to do this. I ended up taking the LSATs my senior year with zero preparation and did terribly. So I never, you know, my heart was never in that. 
And I don't know why. It was just a, a vibe. And I got involved in American history and loved that. I just loved thinking about what happened and why did it happen and how did it happen and could it have happened differently? And how did one thing lead to the next? I had been involved in my in the college radio station before that, my high school newspaper, but I never really put the pieces together and said, oh, I want to be a journalist person. I never for a moment had thought about journalism school. I didn't even, I'm not even sure I knew that journalism schools existed at the time. It was a process of discovery, which was fun. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad it happened like that. And I counsel students today because I find students very stressed out sometimes when they don't know what they want to do with their lives. And they have a roommate or they have somebody down the hall who's known what he or she wants to do since they were in sixth grade. And I, my message is, hey, chill. It's OK. You know, discovery is OK. It's OK not to know every move you're going to make on the chessboard. Some people do. Some people will develop that. Others won't. But if you're open to adventure and to discovery and you can find your passion and know what you care about, that's another way to go, too. And that's kind of what I did, I guess. Well, I would even go one step further and say, not only is it okay that you don't know as you approach May of whatever year it is you're going to be graduating, it is normal, yes. 90%. And this is anecdotal. Of the hundreds of people that I have interviewed on Time for Coffee today, or like you, Frank, and like me, we had no clue what we were going to do when we graduated. And we figured it out, and they will to. This is part of the journey and the exploration. And even though it feels stressful, I would venture to say the fun of life is figuring it out. Yeah. I just have a couple of final questions for you that I try to ask all of my guests. And one of them, Frank, is to share a time in your professional life when you struggled. Maybe you even failed at something. But the most important thing in this story the most important piece is how you persevered and perhaps a lesson that you may have learned in the process. Well, probably uh, professionally, the toughest thing I went through was a very difficult time at CNN when we had a really a scandal over some of the reporting that was done. It was a, a main piece that alleged abuse, and I'm sure you remember this, chemical weapons in Southeast Asia targeting Viet Cong it was during the Vietnam War, Viet Cong guerrillas and American POWs. It was a big deal piece at CNN. And it turned out to be widely disputed and actually discredited. A lot of the reporting wasn't done well. I was brought into it. I was the Washington bureau chief. And I was brought into it just in a little days. I looked at it. I never thought the actual reporting was bad, but I felt that it was written in ways that were, were a little loose. And I said, boy, I can drive a truck through the soundbite. That's actually what I said. Can you document this in other ways? Should you do that in other ways? And the bosses at the company were kind of, oh, this is a really great story. You know, don't mess with this. And it was an intimidating time. It's intimidating kind of top down project it was known as the tailwind thing. You remember it, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and it, it turned into a, a disaster for CNN. And the lesson I from that is I assumed too much. I trusted my colleagues. They were friends in many cases, but I was troubled by it. And I should have been far more assertive. I should have spoken out. I was not in the chain of command, but I saw something that was troubling. And the lesson I from that is I think that everybody needs to say to themselves and to be thoughtful about having what I call a, you know, a lie down on the train tracks moment. You may put your professional life on the line because something doesn't seem right. What is your threshold for that? How will you express yourself? And it's hard because you're going up against the corporate culture or a very forceful vice president or president or whoever's running the joint or whatever else. But you've got to have that. I wasn't responsible for that project. I didn't have hands on it directly, but I was asked to read in on it. And I expressed myself, but not as strongly as I feel I should have in retrospect. So we all stand for something. We all have to take a stand. And that's a lesson I took from that and I'll always carry with me. Well, I actually, Frank, want to take advantage of this opportunity to speak with you because there is a lesson, a very valuable lesson that I learned in my professional career during the time that I worked with you. And it's a very quick story that was extremely embarrassing for me. But it had a profound impact on the person that I am today. And you actually played a super important role in this story. And I also want our listeners to know that you and I 
I've never spoken about this since it happened about 20 years ago. You mentioned that you were the CNN Washington bureau chief. I had just come back from China. It was 1998. CNN's president had just brought me back from China where I was the bureau chief and installed me as CNN State Department correspondent. And I was 34 years old. And boy, was I out of my depth. I mean, this was a classic sink or swim situation. And I think I was sinking. (laughs) And for any aspiring journalists out there, the State Department is a beat. At one point, Frank was CNN's White House correspondent at a different point. And then I was CNN's State Department correspondent, which means I had to be ready to report on any developments relating to American foreign policy anywhere in the world. And after I had been on the job for a couple of years, my contract was up. And Frank, as the bureau chief, took me out for breakfast. And do you remember what you said, Frank? No. You no. You said something to the effect of that CNN, the powers that be at CNN, didn't really have confidence in me as State Department correspondent. And rather than extending my contract, which was up at that point, for another three or four years, which had been the case up until that point, they were only going to extend me for six months, which- Oh, yes. yes. Right? Yes, yes. Which would only be, you know, I guess enough time for me to prove myself. And I want our listeners to know that I let- my pride get in the way. And I bluffed. And I said something like, well, if CNN only wants to renew me for six months, then I guess I'm not going to stay. And we ended our breakfast. And I left to get into a taxi, you know, very shaken to head into the office. And I'm curious, do you remember, Frank, what you thought about my reaction at that time? Yeah. Yeah, that was a conversation. My, what I thought about your reaction was I didn't know what you were going to do. You had the reaction people typically do. Okay, if you're telling me this, people don't like me, I've got to leave. And what I was trying to convey was what our superiors had said, well, there are things that need to be done here. Go to work on this. And it's sort of a probationary period. That's a tough message to deliver. But I thought you would I actually didn't think you were just going to leave because I, I knew you better than that even then. And that, you know, you would double down. So how did... So how did you take it? What did well, you do with it? My God. I mean, my reaction was truly, holy shit. This was me in the cab. Did I just quit? <laughs> oh, my God. And I panicked. And I called my parents and I called my attorney. And I, I said, what do I do? I don't want to leave CNN, but I think I just quit. And so basically, their advice was swallow your pride, go back. And tell them you're going to do whatever it takes. And that's what I did. And I spent the next six months reading every book I could get my hands on. I stepped up my outreach to sources and burned the candle at both ends, even more than I'd already been doing. And six months later, CNN renewed my contract for another four years. And I share that story. And I really appreciate you talking with me about this, Frank, because... It is so important for our young listeners to do exactly what Frank recommended at the outset. I think it was in our espresso shots about going into your jobs with a humble mindset. Because I don't think I had that mindset. I didn't. I had allowed myself to get kind of pumped up by people who were telling me I was going to be a star and everything was that. And I was struggling and I didn't really ask for help. And don't do that. Don't make that same mistake. So thank you, Frank. I just have one final question for you. If you could go back to Middlebury and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Be deliberate. I think that I had a career that moved very quickly in the early phases and opportunities came at me and I took them. And I'm very glad that I did. But I would probably be a little bit more deliberate and step out from myself and take take a step back and say, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? What is the value? I've always been very thoughtful about that. I've always struggled, to be frank about it, about how I balance my family and my personal life and the time I've got there as against my 
career aspirations and ambition because my family is very important. It's the most important thing in, in almost every sense. And so that sense of weighing the deliberateness against the spontaneity, the ability to discover and make a decision then versus, you know, having some career trajectory, life trajectory. Those are the really hard things in life. You know, this isn't choreographed, but a sense of deliberateness, I think, is helpful. So I would just say that mixing in being deliberate with being open to adventure, discovery, and completely unpredictable twists and turns along the way. And then, you know what, giving yourself a break, like no one's perfect. And it's not going to be easy. And it's just you, you got to be grateful for what you have along the way and appreciate the people and the experiences. Because I, there was a young man who was a student of mine, great guy, just a great guy. And he came to me one day, he said he told me about this project he'd launched. And this is a terrific way to end. And I don't know what inspired him to do this. What an unusual young man. He had decided that he was going to do his own gratitude project. And every day for a year, for 365 days without missing a day, he was going to find somebody in his life or in his world to thank for something. And he did that from his father to the homeless person that he had gotten to know. And it was just an amazing thing. So this sort of sense of gratitude and planning and all that kind of stuff, throw it all together and that's life. And I don't know. I don't know that I'm bringing this in for a landing the way we talked, Andrea, but I'm doing the best I can. So there oh, you yeah. Go. I think we're already on the runway. Frank is the author of the book, Ask More, The Power of Questions to Open Doors, Uncover Solutions, and Spark Change. And if you want to learn how to break into the field of journalism, check out the show notes for this episode to see if Frank's Espresso Shots episode has already dropped. Frank... I want to express my immense gratitude to you for your friendship, for your mentorship for me over the years, and for making the Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself and so much of others through this series. It's really terrific. And it has been my pleasure to know you and to watch you grow and go and do everything that you've done in your amazing life. So keep at it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much. <laughs>